But if there is a favorite to finish in the top two, it would be 27-year-old Josh Davis, triple gold medalist from the 96 Olympics. Most golds, Rowdy, by any American man at those games. You know, I have seen Josh Davis take a lot of races out very fast, but I've never seen Josh take it out that fast. And he's still ahead of world record pace of the half. Davis looks like he's going to win it. And Davis sets an American record. He breaks a 12-year-old mark. What a swim for Davis. Welcome to the Ultimate Swimmer Podcast. I'm your host, three-time Olympic gold medalist and captain of the 2000 USA team, Josh Davis. Here at Ultimate Swimmer, we hope to inform, inspire, and encourage you to be the very best version of you, physically, mentally, and spiritually, on your swimming journey. This podcast is geared primarily for those of us in the aquatic disciplines of age group swimming, college swimming, para swimming, open water swimming, and master swimming. But we welcome all who are interested in peak performance, pursuing excellence, and swimming with purpose. So whether you are just starting out in the pool or you've been swimming your entire life, you were born for the water and you were also born for greatness. So each week we will explore the seven core habits of achieving greatness that will help take you to the next level in your journey to becoming an ultimate swimmer. This episode is brought to you by Breakout Swim Clinics, the longest running swim clinic tour of swimming Olympians in U.S. history. Breakout Swim Clinics has been providing swim clubs with the biggest Olympic names for the best prices with gold medal service since 1997. Go to BreakoutSwimClinic.com and bring some of their great Olympians to your team to help your swimmers break out. Bigger names, better prices, gold medal service. Break out with the best. BreakoutSwimClinic.com Hey everybody, welcome to another Ultimate Swimmer Show. I'm your host, Josh Davis, and I'm really excited about this week's guest. He was an age group champion in the 200 breaststroke, national age group record holder, and he was also a national champion in the 400 IM, Olympic champion in the 4x200 freestyle relay, and made his second Olympic team in the 200 fly. The guy can do it all. He's a true ultimate swimmer and one of the nicest guys on the USA team, and I'm so glad he's on this show. Please welcome Gunnar. Vince, welcome to the show, Gunner. Hey, thanks for having me, Josh. Really appreciate it. So, <laughs> it's been, can you can you believe it's been sixty days since Tokyo? So give us give us the lowdown on what you've been doing, and congratulations on your retirement. Uh, what a great career! We're going to talk about that in a second, but give us give us what you've been doing the last sixty days. Yeah, man, I've been uh, I've been traveling a lot. Uh, sort of uh, using this time to reflect uh, and, you know, sort of decompress on a long career. Um, you know, it hasn't been the easiest career. There we are. We're back. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, just sort of trying to enjoy life, um, looking to transition to, into my next career, you know. Um, swimming's been a career for a while for me now. And so um, sort of just uh, trying to enjoy myself, make some memories and, uh, you know, really just be able to um, – unwind from such a such a grueling sport that we all subject ourselves to <laughs> well you've got you, you've had a fascinating career and and i want to talk about that um you've trained a lot at georgia some at texas uh some in atlanta where you grew up and uh kind of a cool little little note you were born the year i was racing in the 96 atlanta olympics yeah yeah i That's actually crazy. have a that's that is crazy, um, and I'll tell you what I've probably raced in that pool more than you have. I would I would say I I swam there a hundred times a year, you know, growing up. But uh, um, oh, yeah. I even have a cool I have a cool little uh, vintage Atlanta '96, uh, you know, ball cap that I wear all the time. It's my favorite hat. But, but um, you know, I just felt like it was sort of destiny, right? I was born in Atlanta in '96, and uh, so there we are. You know, uh, 20 years later, made the Olympic team. So. Um, but yeah, you're right. You know, so grew up in Atlanta, swimming at Dynamo Swim Club. Uh, so thankful for what they did to me, you know, or for me and, and Coach Jason Turcott was my main coach for a long time. Um, then I uh, ended up over at Georgia, went to school there, graduated from there, trained professionally there for about two years. Um, and then, you know, when, when COVID happened, uh, it kind of changed everything. You know, every, everyone's life sort of got flipped upside down. Uh, and I just decided, you know, I'm going to make a change and, um, put myself out of my comfort zone, you know, go do something different. Uh, I lived in Georgia my whole life. So 
moved over to Texas. And, and to be honest, Eddie and Jack are, are you know, best friends. So uh, it was a pretty easy yeah. transition. And, and, you know, uh, I was, uh, I'd be on the phone with Jack every, every week or every couple of weeks, just checking in with him, seeing how he's doing, how, how his group's doing. And then, you know, now the same that I'm done, I, I'm still talking to Jack and Ed all the time. So uh, it's really cool to maintain those relationships. And, uh, you know, they're the same way that I'd be at practice and, and Ed, Ed would be on his phone and he'd get off his phone and he'd say, Jack says, quit floating, warm up. So, you know, they're all, they're always talking. He was, you know, they, they got banter going all the time. So, but it, it was a really cool thing to swim for, you know, two of the best coaches of all time. You know, I mean, uh, not what more can you say about those guys, right? Oh, I know. I mean, two legends, Eddie Reese at Texas, Jack Barrowley at Georgia, uh, Jack's been there over 35, almost 35 years. Eddie's been there over 40, um, you know, just, just mm-hmm. legends. And, but, mm-hmm. but at the same time, super nice, super funny, super inspiring guys. Um, so it is your, your, your ability to train with those two guys is super unique. Can you explain the differences, the similarities, what you took from each, each experience? Yeah. Can you kind of summarize that a little bit? Yeah. Um, well, like I said, they're best of friends. So, um, they're pretty similar guys in a lot of regards, but, um, you're right, man, those, those two training environments in some ways couldn't be more different. Um, you know, I, <clears throat> having grown up training at Dynamo, um, you know, it was a bit of a, a distance program. We did a lot of yardage. We, we really, we put in our work there. Uh, and then, you know, at Georgia, I was a, I was a four I am two flyer. Right. So, um, no shortage of, uh, of long workouts there too, training with Jay, and Jay Littlin and Chase Kalish every single day, you know, so, um, pretty, pretty grueling, pretty grind. Um, and I absolutely loved it. You know, it was, it was what we needed. Um, Georgia's a, a program of, uh, historically, you know, the tough events, right? Um, so Jack, you know, you got to work hard to swim fast in a four I am or a mile or a two fly. So we did plenty of that. Um, and then Eddie, he loves to race, right? So, you know, we, we threw on racing suits at least once a week, sometimes twice. Um, but we were always hopping on the blocks and doing fast stuff. Um, but I, I sort of made the transition this year to the two fly. I decided, um, I, well, I had a shoulder injury, so my, uh, my, my back and breast, it would kind of bug me. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to specialize, really just focus on fly this year. Um, and that was just one thing I loved about Eddie is, you know, we were, we were constantly racing, you know, so many times we'd come in and he'd say, all right, do a meet warm up, and uh, we're just going to go like a uh, broken 150 fly all out or a couple broken 100s all out. Um, so it was so completely different. We definitely, we still put in the yards with that, but um, just a lot more racing. Uh, and I think having had that base from my upbringing and then my time at Georgia, it, it really like carried through throughout the year. So then I got uh, sort of the best of both worlds. And, you know, for whatever reason, uh, Got got on the team this summer and got to go to Tokyo and you know just couldn't be more thankful. Yeah, that's cool. Thanks for kind of uh, explaining some of the differences. Um, but yeah, you talk about that base and you talk about you know being able to race and uh, knowing your paces and knowing when to make your move. That two hundred fly at trials. Uh, you know, just to recap a little bit. You know, twenty sixteen. Uh, to 2021 that was a five-year window that you didn't have a whole lot of big international action yeah you know my uh, my only two uh only two usa national a team trips i've made are the olympics in 16 and 21 i missed every single main team uh in that span right so i don't know i think i just like going to the olympics (laughs) world whatever (laughs) pan pack who cares don't need it yeah, yeah, no, Pan Pax is, you know, but you did go to Pan yeah, Am, I, and that's a good one. Yeah, sure. I, I, you know, I think it's just more of a testament to, uh, you know, not giving up. Uh, you know, swimming is a tough sport, and you fail a lot, and uh, you can fail upwards if if you if you have your head on straight, and you got your mind right, and you, and you keep working hard. Um, but yeah, it's just uh, it's it was it was something that I knew I could do, and uh, I also knew that I had to pivot right. So, like you mentioned, I did the. Um, a free relay in Rio. So I did freestyle there and then I did um, two fly in 20 in 21. And so I actually had a few conversations with Phelps um, about it because, you know, I was just, uh, this was the first Olympics without Michael in a long time in the two fly. Um, 
And so I just wanted, to, you know, help from him because, uh, you know, that regard, you know, the whole two fly, but also just, um, how do you, how, how do you, how do I deal with, you know, swimming completely different races, completely different strokes. So, um, wow. that was something that he gave, gave me a lot of insight and expertise about because, you know, he's, he, he did everything right. And, and every single Olympics, he never had the same lineup. So, um, using sure. tools like that, uh, tools like Michael to, to help you out just is, is something that's, uh, invaluable as well. Do you remember something he said in particular that stood out or one thing you remember? Well, I, you know, Michael is just someone who is just hyper focused. Um, yeah. And he just, he sticks to his routine and, you know, he'll, he'll cut up and, and he, he loves some, you know, good banter at workouts and he'll chirp you if you're not doing the right thing. But, um, you know, he's have he's out there having a good time at practice, but then when it comes to a swim meet, man, he is, he is locked in and he's, listening to his music, he's doing his routine, he's doing his visualizations and, um, you know, you, you, you don't really want to get in his way. Um, so he just, he just said, you know what, <clears throat> stick to your thing, do what, do what you do. Um, you know, stick to your routine and, uh, it'll be fine. It doesn't matter what you're racing. Uh, you know, I was always a 4am or growing up, but you know, as a 4am or the connotates sort of swimming a lot of different stuff. So, you know, I was always, I, I started out really my best event. And growing up in high school was, uh, was tuna breast. You mentioned I had the nag and, and the tuna breast. Well, um, man, I can't do breast stroke to save my life anymore. So uh, I had to make the change to fly when I got to Georgia. Um, d d did freestyle in Rio. So I guess, uh, you know, I, I'm sort of used to switching around too. And it's, it's like your body, uh, your body's going to know what to do with muscle memory um, as long as your head's on straight. And, and really that's sort of what he ingrained in me is just, get your head on straight, do your routine, focus, um, and it'll be fine. And it worked out. So that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Well, that 200 fly at trials, just going back to that moment. In, <laughs> yeah. Uh, June, was it June 16th, about June 16th, June 17th, 2021. And, mm -hmm. you know, Luca was kind of all the talk for a few years. And then granted he's coming off a shoulder injury and now yeah. he's and now he's at Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, so you so you have a connection with him, and then you know Zach's doing his thing, and then mm -hmm. you know you never know what Trenton's going to do, and some and and Nicholas Albiero they go out fast, and and you were kind of just in the middle of the field at the hundred, out in fifty five yeah. three, and then but you have the fastest last fifty thirty point five, basically almost a double O flat coming home and you get the job done yeah. on 50. So yeah, we all, you know, every, everyone's got their own, uh, their own strategy, you know, uh, you know, to be honest, Ed was like, you need to grow up faster because he loves, he loves it when people go out fast. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's been something that's been always a challenge of mine is going out fast enough. Um, but I just, I, I knew, I knew what I had to do. Um, you know, I, I, I trained with Luca a little bit, um, when he first got to Georgia, um, and for, first of all, I just want to say the poise and maturity that he showed after that race, um, after the Olympics, uh, we just, you know, it was so good to see he's, he's going to be one of the USA greats. Um, I can assure you that he's just, his maturity and, and, and poise just really, uh, you know, it astounded me and, and, and it was just uh, really cool to see that. But, um, well, I'll, I'll say this, um, so y'all know y'all. I'm sure y'all have seen Jay Litherland's uh, four AM his last hundred split, especially his last fifty. It's just absurd, right? Well, uh, you just mentioned my last fifty. The two flies pretty good. It was the best in the field. Well, Jay and I have been training together. We swam at Dynamo since we were ten, eleven years old, right? And so he, Jay, Jay has two brothers. He's a triplet. Um, the four of us train together every single day, and you know. Uh, when we had a tough set, we'd, we'd all kind of look at each other and be like, Hey, let's, let's chill. Let's, let, let, let's save up. So we'd always <laughs> kind of relax and then like sprint the last 50 just to mess with each other and like see who could win. Um, actually one time Jay and I, so Dynamo hosts a, a mile meet every year. So everyone swims the mile. Well, we didn't really want to do that. We didn't want to do it freestyle. So we actually asked if we could do it. Uh, I am, this was when Jay and I really first started to be good for him. So, um, we asked Jason, can we do this? I am. So what we did was we did the mile as a 400 fly, 400 back, 400 breast, 400 free, and a 50 fly at the end because it was a 1650. <laughs> um, 
And we kind of, we kind of, you know, we l- relax the fly as much as a 400 fly can be relaxed, um, you know, and then built on and then just sprinted a 50 fly all out at the end there. Um, and for whatever reason, just because of the way we trained like that growing up, <laughs> that sort of became ingrained in our race technique. And so it's like, <laughs> for better, for better or for worse, you know, now, uh, you, you watch Jay, he just comes screaming home at the end. Um, I usually split pretty well at the end too. So it's just, that's, that's how it, how it happened. And, uh, it's just been like that ever since we were young. So, you know, I, I don't know if I can help it, but I've been doing my best to, uh, to try to combat that didn't work, but <laughs> I guess it'll still pay off sometimes. Oh no, it's, it's paying off. You and Jay can <laughs> stick to that strategy. And I think, yeah. you know, Eddie in, uh, Eddie had a guy named Doug Jertson who uh, went out pretty fast in 1989. Sure. And you, you're mm-hmm. probably familiar with him. He was the Swim Atlanta sure. coach for a long time. Yeah. And then I went out really fast in my races to kind of hang on for dear life. And so I think that's where he <laughs> got. But, um, <clears throat> sure. but I'm glad you paced yourself. I'm glad uh, you guys are good on that last 50. It's a great, great way to be. Here's another big question I have for you. <clears throat> mm-hmm. You were part of two very successful Olympic teams, Rio 2016 with the great training camp in San Antonio, Katie Ledecky making history, Michael Phelps' last big Olympics, Ryan Lochte's last big Olympics, you know, a bunch of big names on that team, a bunch of amazing races, Missy Franklin's last Olympics, and then you have to wait five years, and then you're on the Tokyo team, a lot of success and a lot of cool things there. Uh, Caleb Dressel doing his thing. And, you know, again, another batch of great coaches, great leadership. So looking at those two Olympic experiences, those teams, the training camps, the coaches, the locker room talks, the, the speeches, what did you take away about the lessons about leadership, about performing under pressure, about executing when it counts the most? What can you what can you give us from those two Olympic teams that, that you're going to take with you? Yeah, um, Josh, that's a great question. Um, the two Olympic teams I was on could not be more vastly different. Um, so the, so Rio, we had uh, just on the men's side, we had five guys in their 30s: Michael Plummer, uh, Lochte. We, you know, so we had a, we we kind of had an old man's team. Um, this time around, we didn't have a single person in their 30s on the men's side. I think Tom Tom turned 30 while we were at training camp, but, you know, n- not a single 30-year-old qualifier. Uh-huh. Um, and I believe this time around we had, like, um, like I think 40% of the team or something was first-time Olympians. Um, and we had, like, eight people that were still in high school on the team, you know. So it was just, a, it was just so different. Um, we had, but I think we were lucky. You know, I was lucky to be able to be on that first one to have all that experience and then to have Michael as a, um, and, and Anthony Irvin and Nathan Adrian as team captains, you know, and, and to really give that experience and then sort of, uh, fulfill that role in a little bit, uh, in my own way, um, at the second time, you know, um, it's, it's, it's interesting being a second time Olympian because, uh, you feel like, you know, a little bit more, but, you know, sort of when you get to the village, all bets off, you know, it's, it's tough. Um, there's so much going on. You're on your feet. You're walking so much. Um, the food's different. Sometimes it sucks. Tokyo was actually pretty good. I had some really good dumplings. I ate probably about 200 of them in the dining hall there, but, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's, you learn, you learn by just doing it right. But, um, we, the way we swim in the U S with having, um, NCAAs, having the grand prix meets, um, having Olympic trials, especially, uh, it really, it's, it's really good for the Olympics. You know, we, we all say like, uh, pretty much every swim Olympian will tell you that the Olympic trials is far more difficult, uh, far more stressful than the actual games. And, uh, that's, that's definitely true. And that's, you know, that's by design, right? They, they want, uh, this, this stressor, this huge, uh, you know, obstacle, and then once you pass that obstacle, it's really just you're sort of um, cruising to the games and you're just focusing on swimming fast and building that camaraderie w- with your teammates. Wow. Um, and on that note, I will say definitely we were very, it was very close, you know, as a team this year, the men's team, we hung out, we played 
poker, sat around every night um, in big groups. Um, the first time around, you know, because we had such a variance in ages, you know, I was 20 uh, and we had Tony, he was like, he was like 34 or something in, in, in Rio. So, um, you know, that's just such a, a difference in age that we were sort of a, a little like, um, you know, split up in that way. But we had such a, we, we just had a really close group this time around. And, and I think that's just what's so important, you know, is that we're just having fun, um, messing around with each other. Um, Caleb's always such a positive energy and such a, a positive light and, and Murph is such a, um, you know, strong leader and, uh, he instills so much confidence in everyone around him. Um, that I, I think that's why it worked out is just, you know, those, those bonds that we built, um, along the way in training camp, uh, to prepare us for Tokyo. Yeah, that's good. Um, thank you for answering that. What, uh, sure. every Olympian has two things in common. Uh, according to my research, these last 30 years of my swimming and studying Olympians and then finally becoming Olympian myself. And every Olympian has two things in common. You ready? One yeah. is they all they all kind of had a goal. They all kind of had a vision. And many of us had to write down our goals and look at them regularly. Um, and then the other thing, the other thing is we all had adversity. We all had off days. We all had injuries. We all had setbacks. We all had adversity. So those two things fascinate me. There was a kind of a specific vision, a specific goal that we looked at regularly to kind of keep us in the ball game because we had a lot of off days. There was a lot of adversity. Mm -hmm. So can you touch on that? Do you agree with that? Was there, did you kind of have, especially these last five years when not much was going on, how did you stay motivated? Did you have a specific goal? Did you have a specific mental routine to remind yourself what you were about and what was some of the uh, adversities that you had to overcome? Yeah. Um, well, actually I'll start with the adversity. Obviously COVID was tough on everyone, uh, especially in, in swimming, you know, we, it's, it's not that, you know, if you're a runner, you can go run, uh, you know, down the street, but if you're a swimmer, all the pools are closed. Um, you know, I, we did have people swimming in like lakes and stuff, but, um, you know, it's, that, that was tough, but that's tough on everybody. You know, that was pretty universal. Um, but I, you know, I did, I did mention the, uh, the injury that was, that was pretty, you know, that set me back a lot. Um, and Luca and I actually have, have pretty much the same injury. So it's like, um, we're both sort of dealing with that together and it's just something we're going to have to deal with. But, um, you know, in, in, in terms of goals, uh, for sure, um, you know, I had my sights set on the tuner fly this year. You know, I was always a 400 IMR. I was fourth at Olympic trials in 2016. Um, that was just always sort of my bread and butter. Um, and, uh, but I set a goal that, that this time around I was going to do the two fly. And so I, I, I got to Texas and, and Eddie comes up to me and he's just like, he's, he's just like, you know, what are you trying to swim at trials? And I was like, look, Ed, I don't know what really what I'm going to do, but I do know that I think I can make the team in the 200 butterfly. Um, and I'm going to swim a few more events. I was like, sure, I'll, I'll do the 4 am, I'll do the 2 am, um, But I think my best shot's two fly. And so I set that goal. And um, it was really different because I, I was always training with, um, you know, Jay Litherland, Chase Kalish, Andrew Bruzo, all these 4 am studs of Georgia. Um, and then I go – to Texas and say, you know what, I'm going to stop doing that so much. And I'm going to train for the two fly. I got to train with some 200 fly studs at Texas, but you know, so that was the goal I set and, um, you know, I achieved it. And it was just, uh, it was something that I, I, it was in the back of my mind all year. Right. So it, it was like, I'm going to do something different and I'm just going to see if it pays off and work my butt off and, and made the team. So it couldn't be happier. Do you remember any, specific crazy fly sets that were just like good markers like oh yeah this was good this will help me move forward in my 200 fly goals do you remember any crazy yeah. sets from the mine yeah there was <laughs> there was one day in particular actually so so they just built the uh the eddie reese outdoor pool at texas it was finished like two weeks before i got there so it was actually awesome to have and be able to train outdoors but you know obviously when you're training outside uh you know weather weather's a factor so um, during the winter, we were out there most days, and there was one day we were swimming outside, and it was like 31 degrees, it was freezing. Uh, but there's another day; it was cold. It was probably you know um, upper 40s, and it was raining and windy. It was just a disgusting day. And for whatever reason, Eddie sent the 200 flyers outside, 
And he's like, <laughs> you guys are tough. You're tough. You can handle it. Um, and then he splits us up into two fly and then two fly plus. So it was just like the extra, extra tuner flyers. I don't know. I don't even know what it was, but um, the set, I, I can't remember the set, but it was like, a, uh, let's see, it was, it was like a hundred fly on a, on a, or a hundred free on a tight interval, two seventy five fly, uh, three fifties free on a tight interval and then four twenty five fly on 20. Uh, and then it was like just a ridiculous amount of time. Sure. So the, the set ended up being like a 4,000 meter set. Uh, and it was like, and it was like a thousand of it was butterfly or something, you know? So, and, and that was, that was a 200 fly plus group. So, uh, yeah. we, got our, we got our money's worth that day. And, uh, <laughs> it was, it was good. You know, we had a good group of, of guys to sort of, uh, get us through it. But I think that's something that's super important is, is having like a, a group of guys who are, who are right there with you. You know, we're, we're getting this freezing rain dumped on us the entire time just to, you know, add insult to injury, but it almost made it better in a way, you know? So. Oh yeah. So you knew it. it's like, okay, I'm tougher now. Yeah. We're just doing this. Yeah. <laughs> Real quick going way, way back. What was your first interaction with the water? And when did you get involved with swimming? Was it summer league? Was it lessons? Was it just straight to club? How old were you? And what was the dynamic starting out? Yeah, I got I got thrown in a pool at a pretty young age. Um, started doing summer league at uh, three years old, actually. Um, and my aunt had to sew speedos. She had to she had to make my little speedos because they didn't make suits small enough. Um, you could probably fit it on like what, like your balled up fist if you had to. I, I don't know if we still have one of those speedos laying around in my parents' house, but it, it's just hilarious. But um, yeah, I got, did that since I was three, did summer league every year. So I was about 11 or so, 10 or 11. Um, and, you know, did everything else, baseball, soccer, basketball, but, um, realized I really wasn't good at any of those. So I was like, I guess I'll try swimming year round. And, um, started out, I was like a foot taller than all the other guys in my group. They were all eight. I was 11. I just, I wasn't that good. So it just, it took some time. Um, but then I just, you know, I've been doing it ever since, but. Uh, you know, couldn't be couldn't be more thankful for what for what the sport's done to me, really. So, yeah, that's cool. And mm -hmm. both of your parents were successful athletes. What are what are something that they did well that you can look back on? Yeah, uh, both my parents uh, did did a track in college at uh, Barry College up in North Georgia. Um, my dad actually started a. Uh, small business he he does like a antique restoration furniture repair business so i think that sort of instilled in me um you know uh the importance of hard work you know he's working uh 12 hour days sometimes seven days a week you know you, when you own a business you're you're always working so um you know i guess that that definitely uh taught me how to how to sort of self-motivate and, and have a have a, a drive with from within and uh so i think that was really important for me and in, in, in my swimming career that's cool that's good. What are something that your coaches did growing up in the foundational years that Jason or any of the other coaches did in the beginning that really helped set you on a good trajectory, a good foundation as well? Do you remember anything in particular that kind of helped? Yeah. Um, well, I think Jason, Jason was, uh, he was big on, uh, you know, being coachable. <clears throat> he, you know, I always like think about it this way. Like there's, there's three ways to be good at swimming. One, is uh, natural talent, your your God given ability, your biology, all things that you can't really do much about, right? Some people are just good at swimming because they're good at swimming, or because they're tall, or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, some people don't have that, and, and and what they can do to get better is um, hard work, right? They work hard every day, um, you know, work their butt off, and then they can get faster that way too. But I think the most important one is, is being coachable. Um, and that's, you know, listening to what uh, technical advice your coach gives you, um, you know, race strategy, race planning, warm up strategy, you know, things like that. Um, because a lot of times I just I see um, swimmers, you know, a coach says, hey, get a higher elbow catch on this uh, right here. Your, your elbows are dropping a little bit. And that, that is so hard to, you know, cognitively put that in your brain and, um, and, and incorporate that into your swimming. So making those little technical uh, adjustments and things like that. That's the hardest thing in swimming, um, by far, but it's the best way to make you faster. Um, 
you know, when I was training with Phelps in the lead up to the 16 Olympics, we were up at the Olympic training center with Bob and Michael's, I think at the time, 32 training for his fifth Olympic team. Um, you know, best of all time uh, already. Um, and we're doing like a butterfly set and he's like, he's just, you know, asking Bob for all sorts of advice. He's like, Hey, look at my head position on this one. Uh, we need to fix that. It's a little too low. Bob's like, yeah, I think so. Also, I think, you know, your fingertips can do this, whatever, yada, yada. He's 32. He's the greatest of all time. Still working on his technique. And I think that's such a big testament to why he's the best of all time, right? His, his coachability was off the charts and he was constantly looking for ways to tweak his technique, tweak his stroke and, uh, and learn from Bob, who's, uh, you know, an incredible coach as well. So, um, I, I think that's the most important thing that Jason really, really helped me with. I love that. That is a great, great skill. Yeah. Um, what are some epic races in high school that you had? Give us some context of what, how fast you were in high school. And do you have any, any memories of that? Did you do the traditional high school and club or were you all club? How'd you tell us about your high school years and any epic races you remember? Yeah. Um, I did high school. Um, uh, I went to St. Pius Catholic uh, school over in Atlanta. Um, absolutely loved it, but you know, obviously trained at dynamo. Um, and my high school actually, they did their swim practices at dynamo. So they'd be like two lanes over. (laughs) So, you know, I was, I was around them all the time, but had a fantastic time. Um, there's one, there's one race that sort of stands out. Uh, it was like state, state meet, like my sophomore year or something. And <laughs> for whatever reason, you know, you, the, the cool thing back then was like, you got to pick your walkout song. So if you're top seed going into finals, you, you pick the music that you walk out to. And I chose the, uh, the Star Wars Darth Vader theme song and wore a, a Darth Vader helmet and walked out with a, a lightsaber and a cape <laughs> for the race. Um, <laughs> And ended up winning, which was good, because if I had lost that race, man, that would have been so embarrassing. But that was funny. And, and to be honest, I don't even remember what the race was, but there was a, a video on YouTube of it. And I think a lot of people were just like, what is this kid doing? But I thought it was pretty funny. I think my, college, my the high school coach, he still has the uh, he still has the Vader mask, and uh, he, he thought it was hilarious. But, yeah, that's one that stood out. That is epic. I asked for epic, and you <laughs> gave it to me, baby. I love it. Yeah, yeah. You and you and Zach Harding, he should have gone out as Batman at the trials, and you could have gone out as Darth Vader at the trials. That would have been yeah. the bomb. We should we should have planned that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you're right. It does help when you win to do those things, you know. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Um my church in San Antonio that I grew up going to was St. Pius the Tenth, also. Same name, so it's kind of fun. Wow. Cool. Um, Good guy. Oh yeah. So tell us about Georgia. Just just give us some epic Georgia stories. Anything, any epic sets, a fun relay memory or a fun Nancy 2A memory or what, you know, just give us something that you learned at Georgia that you'll take with you from your years as a Bulldog. Yeah, uh, man, I'm so thankful for, for those years. Um, I'll actually be back in Athens this weekend for, for the football game. Um, I just, I, you know, I, every time I leave, I miss it. Um, there's actually this one, there's a fried chicken place called Weaver D's that I used to eat at at least once a week, probably twice a week. Um, and he'd give me free banana pudding. It was just the best. So it's got, you know, that authentic, Southern, you know, it's just the, the best little college town. Um, couldn't be more thankful to have gone there. But, you know, at Georgia, you know, I was looking at, you know, it's a lot of the bigger swim schools when I was being recruited. Um, Georgia was, was a really good school at the time, but, you know, they weren't fighting for national championships. Um but when I took my trip there, it was sort of a courtesy thing because, you know, I grew up an hour away in Atlanta. I was close with Jack and Harv and, and, and just loved those guys. So I was like, you know, what, I'll, I'll take the trip. Um, I don't want to just like, uh, you know, kind of shun these guys who have been so good to me and they're so so close by. Take my trip. And then the next day I'm driving home and I call my buddy. I'm like, man, I'm, I'm going to Georgia, you know, and it, and it was just uh, the uh, – I mentioned before at the Olympic team, but it was, it was the team. It was the guys on the team. It was the, the cohesion, uh, sort of the brotherhood that they have. And then just the coaches, you know, Jack and Harv, who's now, Harv's not there anymore, but, um, those coaches were just, they were just great people. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest takeaways is, is, is Jack, um, you know, who knows Jack and Eddie, who knows, are they the best, you know, set writer swim coaches of all time because of their, their actual, 
you know, swimming IQ and, and, you know, set riding capabilities. I don't know, but I think they're why they are two of the best coaches all, of all time is because of their people skills and their people management skills. Um, and that's just something that was so huge with Jack is he, he was so good at individualizing, um, you know, and, and, and coming up with, uh, solutions to every single person's problems. Um, and, you know, not even just about swimming, right. You know, he's, he's managing the men's and women's team. He's managing 60 plus people. He's been doing that for 40 years. Um, and so I think that just speaks volumes, you know, sometimes, uh, I'll call Jack and, and we won't even mention swimming. Um, and when I was at training camp, uh, I was actually, so I, I trained with Ed this past year, but uh, it was really cool. I actually got to train with Jack at training camp for Tokyo this summer because Ed, Ed didn't go. So I just sort of, it's cool to reunite with Jack a little bit. Yeah. Um, but each time I, I, I touch base with Ed, I, I'd call him every, every couple of days or whatever while we were training just to touch base. And we never even talked about swimming because, you know, he knew I was in good, in good hands with Jack. Um, I had a few texts from Ed where it would just be like a, a video of him going fishing or hunting. You know, I'd be like, yeah, he'd be like, I, I caught a four pound bass this morning. And so it's like, that's, that's what I thought was so cool is that, um, it's not always about, uh, meticulously analyzing every single thing about swimming. It's, it's just about building those bonds. And, and Jack really is, is teaching, you know, it's, he's big on building character, you know, and just, and just being a, a, a good guy and a good friend and a good teammate, you know, and I, and I think that those are the most important things that I learned from Georgia and, and, also Texas, you know, that's, that's why that transition was so seamless. I love it. I agree. My favorite times <clears throat> was with the locker room talks with Eddie, just talking about life. He giving us some life wisdom, some life hacks. And I, I, I cherish those. Yeah. And, yeah. And we I'm, definitely, we definitely won't repeat some of those stories and conversations on here, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's always a good time with those guys. <laughs> oh yeah. And, and then I've gotten to do some gigs with Jack uh, clinics and conventions and stuff. And he is so good. He's so motivating, so sincere and, and enthusiastic. I just, I, I, it's really contagious. And uh, I would like to coach. Yeah, Jack, Jack called me this week and uh, they actually asked, George actually asked him to do the uh, commencement speech at the, uh, at George's graduation this year. Um, and so he's, he's like, gun, I got to tell you, this might be the first speech I've ever actually had to write down, <laughs> you know, cause he would, he just, he loves, he can he can uh, he can pontificate a little bit and he can talk for a while and he's he's such a great speaker and so is Ed but yeah he might actually have to write down a speech for once and I'd love to hear that one yeah he might need actually, an outline he'll polish it up yeah he'll he'll polish it up this time it'll be good oh it'll be great he can wing it with the best though it's awesome <laughs> yeah yeah um fill the people in about the journey from college to pro and that transition. Um, I know you did one season of ISL in 2019, but um, tell us some of the trials and tribulations of, of, of being a, a pro swimmer. Uh, it, it's not all glamorous. It's not all easy. It's nice to have some flexibility. It's nice not to be in school and, and to focus on swimming sleep and, and the balance. But give us, yeah. give us uh, you, and I, you and I honestly haven't talked about pro things all that much. Um, mm -hmm. But give me, give, me your, give me your take on your experience as a pro swimmer, what you would have done differently, what worked out well for you? Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a tough transition and it's a big change. Your whole life changes. You know, you're not, uh, all of a sudden you're not going to class all day. Um, you know, you don't have, uh, all these responsibilities, but I think, um, you know, a lot of people don't realize, you know, you're in school, you're getting a scholarship check. Um, you're not worrying about your meals, you're on meal plan, uh, et cetera. But, um, then it becomes your job and it's, it's completely different. And I think that's why some people struggle is because of that, uh, pressure they put on themselves. And, and a lot of times it's like, Hey, if I don't win this race, Hey, if I don't make this team, like, uh, I'm, I, I can't afford to keep going. I can't make a living off of this. So it, it really becomes a completely different ball game. Um, and it's, it's tough and it, and it makes it such, uh, such a more difficult mental task too, just to have all that stress that you put on yourself. Um, you know, it's, it's tough, uh, too, because if you're not like Ryan or Michael, um, you know, the money isn't, you know, great in swimming. So, um, that's just something you have to be really good about is, is budgeting and, uh, and things like that. But we did get lucky with the ISL. Um, I did, I did my first season with uh, team iron 
I was on the Hungarian team. That was fun. And then last season I, I was with uh, Cali Condors. So um, that was a ton of fun. I mean, I, I didn't do it this year around. Maybe I should have because it, it looked pretty nice down there in Italy. But um, that kind of changed the game. You know, it allowed us to uh, make a little bit more money and, and make uh, you know a little bit of a bigger name for ourselves. And, um, you know, I think I, I like everything that's going on there. I think they're doing a great job. Um, but it's, it, it is a huge transition. And um, I just think, you know, it doesn't work out for a lot of people because because um, what I just said, you know, everything changes. And sometimes that's, uh, that's a little tough on people. Yeah. Well, thanks for giving a little insight into that because everybody mm-hmm. thinks, oh, that's the end all and be all. And, and some people think about college swimming. College swimming is very, very difficult. It's super fun, but very difficult. Pro swimming, it's another level of different challenges. And um, yeah, so I, yeah. I appreciate that insight. What was it like being on uh, the difference between Iron and uh, Cali Condors? Give a, you know, because Iron's yeah. based the hungry based team with uh, the Iron Lady yeah. Tinka, and then uh, yeah. Cali's got a whole different vibe. So give, yeah, us, give was, us the differences. It, it was really, it was really different. Um, I was actually the only American uh, on that team, and most of the people were Hungarian. So. <laughs> The meetings sometimes were like half in Hungarian. I'm like, what's going on? I don't, I don't really know. But uh, they were great. You know, it was really cool. They were really understanding of, of my situation and um, had a fantastic time. But, uh, you know, the, the, they just didn't really have, since they, most of them were, you know, Europeans, um, a lot of them didn't have that NCAA college experience. Um, and so uh, that's sort of what the ISL is trying to build is that team, you know, uh, mentality and that, that team uh environment that is so strong and so important to the NCAA. Um, and so then when I got to Cali, that's a little bit more what it was like, is it felt like we were on a college team again and, and we formed those bonds again that we were forming when we were back at school. Um, since most of the Cali swimmers were Americans, we all had, had, you know, similar experiences in that regard. So, um, it was, it was, it was cool to, to see both sides, you know, of the coin there. But, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, uh, you know, obviously Cali is, is probably the best team there. They won last year. Obviously we won, but this year they're probably the best team again. And I think, you know, it speaks volumes that because most of those, those uh, swimmers have had their NCAA experience. I think that's just like, it's so, so important to why they're swimming so fast. Yeah. Did you do any, any fun sets with Caleb while you were on the team? To Caleb, he's in sprint group. I don't know. I didn't really do anything. With it. <laughs> <laughs> I, wish, man. I, I wish I could be in sprint group. Uh, um, no, actually, uh, we, I actually, man, Caleb, he does not get enough credit and, uh, you know, he gets a lot of credit, but I, I honestly think he still doesn't get enough. Um, he, he works his butt off and, t- uh, Florida does like test sets. I think they do like, uh, 2400s, you know, best average long course every single year as a test set. And he's in there with all of them. He's doing it. And, uh, I've done, he, they came and trained at Georgia for a week once and like, you know, he, he, he's not, he's not just in sprint group, Like he's, he's putting in the yards. Um, there was one, we did a, we did a pretty grueling kick set one day. And then I see, a, I see him on the side of the pool. I'm like, ah, typical sprinter getting out early. But, and I look over and his whole quad is like, is like pulsating like this. He's in these like horrible cramps. And I'm like, man, actually he's just probably working harder than I am. And so he's like, his body's shutting down, but he, he freaking works, man. And I think a lot of people now are, are saying like, you know, um, I'm a sprinter. I need to do less, less, and less. But I think he's a testament to, uh, you know, just hard work works, right? He, he works his butt off and he'll put in the yards, you know, but um, it, it's, it's really cool to see that from him. Yeah, no, I mean, all the vibes I get from him when I've talked to him personally and talked to Coach Greg, he just says, whatever, whatever I need to do, I'll do it. And yeah. uh, it's, it's yeah. awesome. Um. So real quick, we got just a few minutes left, and I want to get your opinion and your advice on the seven habits of highly effective swimmers, uh, the seven things that it takes to be an ultimate swimmer. Uh, number one is technique, uh, or what we call finesse. Do you, have a, do you have a particular technique tip for free or fly that you could throw out there for, for folks? Yeah, um, I think almost no one – has, especially in age group, I don't think anyone has enough high elbow catch. Um, and when I do clinics, I, that's something that I really harp on. And I think your uh, elbow, you know, the upper part of your arm should literally be parallel to the surface of water. And then your forearm should be perpendicular to the surface. So it's like a full 90 degree angle. And if you watch the best, of the best, you know, you look at uh, Michael's 
fly underwater. His elbows are right underneath the surface of the water because his elbows are so high. I don't think anyone, you know, even myself included, that was something I was always working on. Um, but it's, you know, especially with technique, like I was talking about with coachability, just, um, that needs to be constantly evolving because our bodies are constantly changing as we get older, as you get to college, everything changes. Um, and so your swimming needs to change as well. Um, so I, I don't know if I necessarily have like, uh, specific things, but there was something that I did was every, every single year, every single season, I would challenge myself, um, I wouldn't do time goals a lot of the time. I, I, I wasn't big on writing down numbers and times, but I was big on like, hey, this year I want to um, do this with my stroke. This year I want to change this, um, you know? And so like for for a season, I'd be like, all right, well, maybe I'll just try to um, catch with, with uh, my fingers open like this, like some of the Aussies do. Um, and if I didn't like it, I would just go back to normal, right? So always playing with yeah. your technique and always changing and, and trying to evolve, I think is, is, is the most important thing. I love that. Number two is fitness. The importance of being tough. You know, we do doubles, nine swims a week, three lifts is kind of the typical formula. Um, what is, what is some advice you have about just putting in the work and, you know, yeah. you, you were probably in one of the hardest groups on the planet, the Georgia mid four and I am group. Distance yeah. group. What's, what's your advice on getting fit? Yeah. Uh, toughness is big. You know, it's, it's, it's just about how much, pain you can handle you know it's about how much grueling uh intensity you can handle um but uh you know i i think uh i think you know in some ways a lot of a lot of swimmers are overtrained, and i think doing other ways you know other things um outside the water is important too i think covid taught taught us a lot about swimming um and you know you're seeing world records get broken you're seeing best times caleb swimming you know just as fast as ever right now um and we're all out of the water for like two months, you know, but um, we all stayed active. I know I, you all probably saw on Caleb's Instagram, he's doing these huge, crazy lifts the entire time, right? Um, we were out there because we had a tennis court open. We were playing tennis for like six hours a day, you know? So I think sometimes, you know, even if you're not in the water, you're taking breaks, just, just being active um, and just moving your body and uh, doing other, other things can, can help you, you know, in the long run because it strengthens little muscles that you may not be strengthening while swimming. Um, and just, yeah, it, it just keeps, it, it's like a good mental break, right? So that, that COVID break we all took was, um, obviously, uh, tough and difficult and, and, and the world has changed because, because of it. And it's, it's awful to see. Um, but at the same time for a lot of swimmers, it, it was kind of a, a good mental, like decompression and it sort of made us realize why we love the sport and why we do it. You know, it, it made us itch to get back to it. So, um, those breaks can be good too. That's cool. The number th uh, number three is flexibility, the importance of having full range of motion so you can streamline and do the strokes right. Do you have a favorite stretch? Yeah. Or are you a big stretcher guy? Yeah, stretch. Um, uh, I, I'm six five. I can touch my toes. I feel like that's pretty good. Uh, I just I've, I've always had pretty high full mobile uh, joints and my, my shoulders are really flexible. Um, you know, I used to be able to like uh, cross my arm like all the way over behind my behind my head but uh now my shoulders are kind of messed up so i don't really do it anymore but um uh, yeah i i think maintaining flexibility that's something you that is very important um and you should probably stretch every day i i would just like you know when i'm watching tv i'd be foam rolling and stretching out um but yeah nothing in particular I, I think just like general you know the general stuff is, is all pretty good for stretching yeah. That's cool. Number four is nutrition, the importance of proper fueling for our, our machines, our bodies. Um, you know, as swimmers, we can kind of eat anything, but uh, do you have, did you have some big changes that really made a difference for you? Did you have some favorite go-to foods or anything in the nutrition realm that really helped set you apart? Yeah. Once I started cooking for myself and I got off meal plan, um, I really, um, sort of start playing with that and figuring out what I needed and what my body needed. And, um, you know, it's, I think, yeah, you're right. Uh, especially if you're training a lot, um, you know, it's hard even to get enough sometimes, um, uh, you know, carbs are so important. We're, we're burning so many calories that it's like intake, like you can't even intake as much as your body needs. Um, so I, I ate a, like, but I wasn't unhealthy, you know, I actually ate, ate very healthy, but I just had to eat a lot. <laughs> So I don't know. I, I think it's different for everyone. You, you kind of have to play with it, um, figure out what's best for you. But 
uh, just be generally healthy. You know, I, I don't even know if there's like a, a cure all, whatever, uh, you know, one simple trick to save your swimming. But, um, if you're generally healthy, you're eating right, you're eating enough. I think you're going to be just fine. Yeah. Number five is fun and focus. We now talk about the mental being, uh, you know, setting your goals, being focused, but keeping the right attitude, the right attitude of gratitude, keeping it fun. So what are some, and we've talked a little bit about this throughout the program, but just some mental tips that kept you engaged and excited about the process. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mentioned uh, how hyper-focused Michael is and he's locked in and he's got his headphones in and um, he's doing his thing. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, to be honest, uh, that was not what I did. And so uh, Jay, Jay Livellin and I, you know, we'd always be our, our, you know, our strategy was, was different. Like we'd be in the ready room before a 400 IM, like at um, the Olympic trial final or something. And we'd be like messing around, like playing like rock, paper, scissors and poking each other and, you know, not listen to music. That just wasn't really my thing. So, um, but that was my way of focusing, um, was just focusing on enjoying myself and enjoying what I was doing. Um, so I think just, you know, do what you like to do, um, make it fun, do what you need to do, but also, you know, do what you need to do to swim fast. You know, if you're, if you're screwing off too much, then you're not, you're probably, you know, you might be hurting yourself, but, um, yeah, I think just finding, finding what's best for you, what routine. That's good. Number six is family and friends, the importance of healthy relationships to create low stress. So the body's freed up to perform at its best. So it sounds like you got a great relationship with your family and you made great friends on the USA team and the Georgia and all around. So give us some, some emotional relational tips that have helped you. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's so important. Friends and family, it's, it's those bonds are, are kind of what get, you know, get you to where you want to go. Um, after I made the team, I, I put this in my like Instagram caption. I was like, I'm a product of, a, of my environment and those who I surround myself with, you know, it was truly those people that got me there. Um, I, I was motivated by my team and my family and everyone that was around me. Right. So I couldn't have done it without them. Um, I, uh, yeah, it's just, that's, that's, that's so vital, you know, those strong bonds and, uh, <clears throat> also, you know, look up to the heroes, right? So when I was swimming at, at a club at Dynamo, when I was first starting out, first starting to get good, <clears throat> I had a, a guy who I used to train with. His name was Jack Lane. He ended up swimming. He was a hunter flyer, went to Stanford. Really good swimmer, one of the top recruits back in the day. Um, and, you know, he was sort of my idol, you know. I, I looked up to him. He was, like, one of the fastest swimmers. So I was like, this guy's awesome. Um, but what I did was I made sure <clears throat> to – you know, just feed off of him and, and, and learn from him. And I just stuck to his hip and swim practice every single day. You know, I, I did what I could to be as close to him as I could in every single set and every single workout. And then, you know, started to be where some days I'd beat him. Some days I'd be right there with him. And then so it, it just like um, culminated that way. And then once he left and he, he, he went to uh, over to Stanford to swim, I got to sort of do the same thing with those younger guys that were on the team. And, and hopefully, you know, I was, I was able to be a leader for them. And, and so, um, I think that's really important, you know, is like uh, find those leaders and find those people with those good qualities and, and skills and then learn, learn that and then do the same um, and instill those same things and same traits to the others. Yeah, that's great advice. I know that worked for me, too. All my best friends happen to be on the swim team and they happen to be faster than me. And, it, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, okay, I'm not missing anything because I'm with my friends and we're pushing each other. And, you know, it really creates an environment of success. And the last seventh and final habit is faith, the importance of being spiritually strong and just having that spiritual connection with God. Do you have any any faith tips, spiritual tips that you can share? Yeah, um, you know, I think uh, it's just thankfulness, you know, honor, you know, just honor, honor for what got here. You know, um, <laughs> it's like I said, it, you don't, you're not doing it alone, you know, no matter what you believe in, you know, you just you just have to have have gratitude. You know, there's, 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 it's, it, for what, you know, whatever's out there, whatever you believe in, you know, just, just, just gotta be thankful, have That's gratitude cool. for it, you know? That's cool. And we want to get to know you a little bit more, your favorite things. What's your favorite color? Ooh, uh, I like turquoise, like a nice lighter, yeah, a little lighter blue. Yeah. Maybe uh, kind of, kind of, cause it's water, you know, water. I don't know. That's kind of weird. Sure. I never even thought about that. Yeah, no, bluish is my favorite too. Uh, <laughs> favorite food type? If you could have any food, what would you what would you get? Man, I just I love a really good, perfectly cooked steak. Just 
really good steak, man. <laughs> of all the events, what's your favorite event? Tuner fly, um, tuner fly long course. Sometimes like a tuner fly long course. Uh, I had a few, especially that were just like really easy. Actually the, um, in Tokyo, the Olympic prelim, like my, we do lactate testing and my lactate was like uh, a 10. I don't, a lot of people probably won't know what that even means, but that's pretty low. And so it was like, sometimes for whatever reason, if you're nailing every, you know, you're, you're just feeling good, uh, keep it easy. Um, it can be like the easiest race, you know? Um, and I think that's why, you know, uh, but if your hips drop, whatever your technique goes, it's probably one of the hardest races. So it's just this weird fine line, but, uh, I've had some two flies that were just fun, easy, chill. And, uh, yeah, so probably two flies. Good one. Definitely not the four I am. <laughs> and it sucks. That was a four I ammer, but. <laughs> um, yeah. Cause I was curious which one you'd pick, you know, I am free or fly. No, man, no one likes the four I am. If they, if they say they do their line, I'm telling you. Yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite pool you've ever raced in? You have a favorite pool to train a race in? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think Georgia had one of the best pools to train in. Um, we were really lucky for that to have have that have that natatorium there. It was great, one of the fastest pools in the world, I think. But one of the favorite pools to race in, um, I really like Toronto's pool. I went there for Pan Ams in 2015. They had an incredible venue, it was beautiful, um, and they packed that place out. And it was one of the loudest meets I've ever been to. Um, yeah, it was incredible. Um, and then actually, I did a Junior Worlds in Dubai, and they had a, just a incredible venue um that place was just stunning polished beautiful so that, that was a really cool one too yeah favorite city you've ever been to as a tourist oh yeah uh i love barcelona beautiful city beautiful people incredible food love barcelona i've, he I've mm -hmm. heard that from my yeah. old olympic friends who went in 92 they loved it there yeah um fav favorite music favorite genre do you have a yeah, um, I kind of like, uh, I don't even know how you describe it. It's like uh, retro, like stuff that's new but sounds old. I like um, Black Pumas, uh, Lake Street Dive, St. Paul and the Broken Bones, um, Lady Ray, uh, Leon Bridges, stuff like that. you have a favorite movie or book? Uh, favorite book? I really liked Scar Tissue by Anthony Cadis. He was the singer of the uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers. It was an autobiography um and that was just a roller coaster it was crazy it was a crazy book about you know all that he's been through and i think everyone should read it uh, it's not for the fan of heart <laughs> but and i uh i really like parasite that last year that korean film that was really cool that was that was a good movie that's cool yeah uh do you have a favorite move in the weight room favorite dry land activity yeah i like i like well <laughs> I liked cleaning. I used to do hand cleans a lot and I think that was probably my best thing. I wasn't a big weight room guy. I'm not real strong. Um, I think I was better in the water, but, um, I liked to clean and then I, I broke my collarbone and then I, uh, tore a labrum in my other shoulder. So I, I couldn't really clean. So I haven't done that in like five years. <laughs> that used to be my favorite exercise. Wow. That's cool. <laughs> and lastly, do you have any shout outs to any sponsors or family, friends, just, you know, thanking them for yeah, for, for your career and all yeah. that. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, Mizuno, sponsored by them. Um, thankful for them. I was wearing their suits for so long, and uh, you know, they've, they've. I think they definitely have the best suit on the market. It's an incredible company and incredible, incredible people. You know, that work there, and then just like I said, all my friends and family, um, products of of my environment, and those I surround myself with. You know, couldn't have been there without without those people. So, thanks to all them. I love it. I love it. Well, thanks for sharing your stories and your career with us. Congratulations. You're now officially done. And uh, but uh, you, we're really proud of you. You have a lot to be proud of. And uh, can't wait to do a clinic with you, hopefully, one of these days soon. So we can teach the kids together. Yeah. Do that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, thanks, Josh. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Look forward to the next one. Thanks. Have a good one, Gunner. Yeah. All right. All right. Bye. Thank you for joining us on this Ultimate Swimmer podcast. We hope you enjoyed hearing from these Olympians and life champions and how certain habits and decisions help them on their journey, and they can help you too. If there is an Ultimate Swimmer from your team that you would like to nominate that we can recognize on our show, just email me at josh at joshdavis.com. That's josh at 
joshdavis.com and tell us about how your ultimate swimmer is making a difference in your swimming community. And that's the goal, to make a difference and swim with purpose. Not only are you getting better, but you're helping those around you get better too. When you realize you were born for the water, born for greatness, and born to serve others, you are on your way to becoming an ultimate swimmer. I'm Josh Davis. Until next time, keep streamlining and keep smiling. See you around the pool soon.